Um, Sam mentioned that um, he saw a video of me playing on a bus. And uh, there's this wonderful presenter in San Francisco who is really trying to incorporate things about San Francisco into all of the performances. Um, so they're very site specific. And he reached out, out of the blue and said, hey, you know, will you come and play on a bus that's driving around the city? <laughs> and, and he still didn't quite have the logistics worked out. And I thought it was such a crazy idea. I said yes. And, and I've always. I've always tried to have the philosophy that I try to say yes to crazy things when possible, um, because nearly everything like that leads to something else, to something else, to something else, to something else. So I think this is a perfect example. Um, and the bus, he had, the bus had no seats in it. It was an old, like an old, old school bus with no seats. Very, very unsafe. <laughs> and the audience was sitting down on the floor. There, I think there were a there were a couple benches around the edge, and. Um, I had to sort of incorporate the rumble of the the diesel engine, the <laughs> the um, uh, you know powered engine, <laughs> which was very loud. So um, the pieces were you know had this like low rumble on the bottom. But um, I really wanted to play this piece, Sun Will Set, out at the beach. By the time we got there, we went all the way slowly through Golden Gate Park and then out to Ocean Beach. And I timed it so that I could do a version of this piece. So I think I'll just start out, start out with that piece. So try to imagine that you're on a bus <laughs> and you're pulling up to the beach.
Um, I was invited pretty recently to play at a festival. Um, and it was an interesting kind of smallish festival, and I was meant to both perform and talk. Um, and I was, you know, set to go. And then I got an email from somebody who was putting the talks together. And uh, she had a list of bullet points that they wanted me to hit on the talk, that they wanted all the participants to talk about. And um, it wasn't, there wasn't any particular subject matter, but it, it, it was very structured about like how long you should talk about your personal story. <laughs> you know, like, and then at five minutes in, you should hit the following. Make sure to be authentic. <laughs> Make sure you're authentic. Don't forget, audiences love it when you're a little bit vulnerable. Smile a lot. <laughs> and so on and so on. And um, I read that, and I was like, gosh. <laughs> um, I wrote back, you know, well, I'm looking, really looking forward to this, but um, you'll get Zoe Keating, <laughs> and I'll be my authentic self. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I can't promise that I'm going to, uh, you know, conform to the time, you know, the exact bullet points. And um, it turned out to be kind of a bit of an issue and I was really surprised by this, and I, it made me think about things quite a bit, um, because um, in the Silicon Valley and such, uh, this sort of, you know, we can measure absolutely everything, right? You can, you know, everybody knows the TED format. They know how that works. There's a pattern to it. They know that the personal stories and the vulnerability and all that, and they know what gets a good response. Um, and then you can try and you can create something based on those metrics that you've analyzed. And in Silicon Valley, that's a really big thing right now, like being deliberately authentic. <laughs> and so I've almost become allergic to the word, <laughs> and I, I need to, it's gotta be some other word, because part of my process is trying to, well, be authentic, but <laughs> it's trying to find out who the real me is. And taking that song that I just played as an example, um, for me, the process of composition is really a design process. like. I go in the studio and I create kind of a wall of sound and then I leave the studio and I'm left with some memory of what I did and um, it's like the memory of what I did in the studio and probably it's not actually all that accurate but I it's sort of like some distilled feeling, some thing and then I spend the next bazillion years trying to actually really create it, <laughs> that feeling without ruining it, <laughs> without making it so perfect that you ruin it. And as an artist, it's like, I am well aware that like that song that I just played, Sun Will Set, I know that if I could make another song exactly like that one, it would probably make just as much money as that song did. Because that song, I license it like you wouldn't believe. Um, and, you know, I tried not to be aware of that. A lot of artists I know who've had ever any kind of success, they really struggle with this problem of, you make something that is relatively successful and then you really feel like, gosh, well, what, what, is, what is so great about that? And you try to analyze it. And then, of course, thanks to the wonder world, for world, world of the internet, you can actually see and you can measure so many things about something. Um, and I um, try really hard not to do that. <laughs> you know, I suppose it's an open question whether when something is so, um, when you triangulate a result, a product, a song, um, 
or you have the same thing and you end up on it accidentally. If the result is the same, does it matter? And I don't know how it is for the world of commerce, but I think for art, it does matter. If I have the same piece, but one of them I got there algorithmically <laughs> by analyzing metrics, and the other one I got there naturally without thinking about it, I think there's going to be a difference. So, um, so I've just been thinking about that a lot. I ended up not going to this performance. <laughs> uh, it was I was not it was unpaid. It was sort of a social thing, and I had a life event that came up that prohibited me anyway. And but that helped me say no. And I had to decline. And I had to be honest about my decline and say that I felt like I couldn't um, I couldn't reconcile my um, artistic sense of freedom <laughs> with the limitations in that. Um, and I'd never done that before. I, so. Anyways, I just thought of this just now. <laughs> Seemed relevant. <laughs> now I'm going to play a piece that has nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> just because I want to play it. <laughs>
piece was called Escape Artist. It's roughly about escaping from something, as you could probably tell. <laughs> that feeling of when you uh, are running away from one thing and you are running towards something that you think you're running towards and you get there and you're like, oh no, that wasn't it either. And then you run from that back to where you came from. <laughs> and then you go back and you do that a few times. So that was, th that, was the, that musical feeling. Um, I'm gonna play this next piece. Um, one thing that, um, going back to that, okay, so what are some synonyms for authenticity? <laughs> How do we take back this word? Because <laughs> um, um, I'm thinking about, uh, again, the, the, the process of making music, and there's always this desire for me, like a, a piece, again, is like this design problem where I'm trying to figure out, like, what's the way, what's the most effective way to get this across, this feeling? And then there's the technical aspects of what I'm doing, and how I'm trying to layer it all up, but without having the technology get in the way. Like, I don't want you to have the experience of, like, I, here I am operating this machine. I want it to be kind of seamless. And I want you to, like, have the experience that I'm having. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to make that, to make that happen. Um, and then there's a lot of practicing that work. So a lot of my practicing is, like, practicing the technology part. And then as I get, it gets sort of more facile as I'm on stage and things are easier and easier. And eventually I hit the next wall. Like first there's the wall of like not being able to actually achieve what it is that I want to achieve. And then once I've got it, the next wall is that it gets too easy. <laughs> and so there I am on stage and I'm not sure how many other performers have this issue. Maybe we don't talk about it that much. But um, if, if a piece of music becomes something that I don't, um, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I don't perform it as well. <laughs> it's like it has to be a little bit scary. And I didn't, I didn't realize any of this for the longest time. And so I would, I would have a piece going, and it would, I would have done it like on tour many, many times, and it would be great, you know, it'd be awesome. But then I would feel like I wasn't feeling it, like I wasn't feeling it. And so I'd always try to change something about it. So the, the piece would change gradually, like musically, it would start to evolve, like each performance would be slightly different. And that was sort of more satisfying for me, so I could still feel like there was a there there. Um, and without the there there, I felt like it wasn't that I was cheating the audience. I'm doing this for myself. Like I was cheating myself and I want that experience. <laughs> so it's very selfish in a way. And um, I discovered that I could have, there was another way to change things, which is that I could always change my equipment. <laughs> and for a while, um, you know, software is still, it's still true. But um, like, for example, for this set of shows, I have a new method of making the pieces work, which I'm trying out, which is slightly scary because I never know if it's going to go right. And then I have a new pedal today, which I have only used for this. Today's the first time I'm using it, so <laughs> it seems to be working well. Thank you. Um, but having, having that, like just having something that I've changed, like sometimes I'll redo my Apple scripts or something like that right before, before um, performing. And that makes it so that things go wrong, but then it also makes it so that um, I'm a little bit on edge and that that makes for a better performance. So. So this piece is a new one, well, relatively new. I, sh I shouldn't say it's really new, because now it's a couple years old. Um, but uh, this way of, I'm still developing, I'm still working on it, and I'm trying to figure out where it should go. Um, and I haven't quite decided that yet, so here's the version I have today.
This is one of those pieces that um, I don't know why I, I, I like the studio versions are always very different than the live ones and this one shifts and shifts and shifts and shifts and it's called the path and according to my um, program I'm on the path 4.4 
And at some point, I think when I get to like the next like a major version number, I'm going to give it a new so name. Like it's going to be a new song. <laughs> We're going a little later. Do we still have the room? Do you need me to shut up soon? <laughs> I know <laughs> you're all right. It's not like the, they're going to come in and like herd us all out onto the cruel streets of Portland on a beautiful evening. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to play a couple more songs for you. That's right. Um, this one is called Tetris Head, and it originally came about. 
I did not play video games as a kid, but all of my friends did and all my neighbors did. And um, I would watch them playing Tetris. Um, and I tried playing it myself and I would just get stressed out and uncomfortable and video games just made me feel really like, ah, ah, I didn't like it. But I was, I really enjoyed watching other people play it. It was kind of relaxing <laughs> to watch someone else play Tetris. Um, and so when I got into making music, um, that state of mind that I would get into when I would put together, you know, I started looping and layering, and I feel like all these little musical pieces are coming down in their little Tetris shapes out of the sky, and, and if I'm really in the zone, they all fit, just fit together perfectly, and it's so satisfying. And so that state of satisfaction is called Tetris head for me, um, and that's what this piece was about.
So, um, I'm uh, got this one piece here I'm going to play for you called Optimist. And it's a piece that I wrote for my son, Alex, who is, um, my cat is named Max. <laughs> that, was, that was a choice. You know, I, I'm sure that as all parents, we make our lists, you know, of names. And Max was definitely on the list. But I felt so strongly when I was pregnant that his name was Alex. Like, for no reason. I was like, his name's Alex. And, but, you know, we did that thing that other parents do. Of we made our lists, you know, and we had probably all the trendiest names <laughs> that there are. I'm not saying Max is trendy, but I'm saying, you know, it ended up being that, of course, the list of names we had were very similar to the list of names that all of our other liberal parents <laughs> in the Bay Area had. And, um, and so then he was born, and, you know, we're going through the list, and I'm like, I really feel like his name is Alex. He looks like an Alex. And um, that was his name, so. <laughs> but anyways, um, when, uh, when he was living inside my stomach, um, uh, I had this sort of image of this little imp jumping and singing and running down a hill. And, and I was just kind of imagining, like, what is that going to be like? And I was imagining, what is the world going to be like? What, what, what is it, you know, what's it going to be like? And I was thinking it would be full of trials and tribulations and, uh, you know, suffering and all the things that our lives are full of. But it'd also be, be full of sort of joy and, and stuff. And um, so this is the piece that I wrote for him just a couple months before he was born. And, um, yeah. So.
Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you.